Uh, here we are. Francis Slingsby, are you with us on the call? Yes. Hi, Frederick. Hello, there. everyone. Good morning. Uh, hi, good morning. There we are. So it worked. That's uh, good to see. It so, did indeed. Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Um, so you're in, you're in Boston, right? I am indeed. A cold morning here in Boston. Uh, same here. Grey also. And this just shows you the true international potential of this, uh, this industry. So let's uh, get started here. Um, uh, let's, let's, uh, why don't you start off with a uh, bit of introduction, maybe first of all about yourself and also uh, the, um, the portfolio that Erstead is uh, focusing on in the US and where you see yourself in maybe 2035. Yeah, happy to. Um, very briefly, my name is Francis Slingsby. I head up our commercial and our market development for Ersted in uh, the US. Um, been with Ersted for 10 years in the UK originally, um, in Denmark for a number of years, and now the last four years here in the US to really watch the industry take off here. Just going to share just a, a few handful of slides here very quickly just to give you a sense of where Ersted is. So, John, if we can just jump to the first one. Um, Ersted, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with us, we are the global leader in offshore wind, uh, 6.8 gigawatts of install capacity, 3.1 gigawatts under construction in Asia Pacific, in Europe, and also in the US. We've just recently concluded the construction of Dominion's pilot project for them down in uh, Virginia, uh, which is excellent, the two, the two turbine demo project there. We have over one and a half thousand turbines spinning. Um, so this really is a proven track record in an industry that is very well established, as you said, Frederick, in an excellent presentation in Northern Europe. And it started back in 1991. Uh, so we've been building wind farms for many, many years. Uh, we have America's first offshore wind farm, Block Island, um, and obviously just concluded the Dominion project as well, which was a great, great collaboration there. We also have the world's largest offshore wind farm, 1.2 gigawatts, powering over a million homes uh, in the UK, and that's the Hornsey One. So a, a very kind of like, uh, strong and long track record in offshore wind and this for our company is, is a very exciting growth area it really has been the backbone of Ersted for the last 10 to 15 years so if we move to the next one john please great so looking here these three pictures tell you why offshore wind along the eastern seaboard of the us is a very attractive proposition you have on the left the demand close to shore and that's where offshore wind where onshore renewables are often very site constrained uh, plays a very attractive role. You have a world-class resource, and then you have a large buildable continental shelf. And that translates into what we're seeing in the markets, John, if we can move to the next slide, which is a potential for more than 25 gigawatts confirmed by states already. And these are the states that are in the game today. And starting from the left, we have Rhode Island, which was the original founder of offshore wind with the Block Island wind farm. We have Maryland uh, coming in for about uh, 1.82 gigawatts. We've got Connecticut coming in for about three gigawatts, Massachusetts coming in for about four to five, uh, for about three and a half gigawatts. Virginia recently launched the 5.2 gigawatt target. And then as we move out, we've got New Jersey at seven and a half and New York at nine gigawatts. These are state mandated solicitations that will take place, needs to be in, in place before uh, the middle of the next decade. So this really gives the momentum to offshore wind. And if we move to the next slide, I'll just tell you a little bit about where Ersted stands in this picture. We have over 2.9 gigawatts of awarded capacity in solicitations already. Um, as I mentioned, we have two operational wind farms uh, under our belt. One of those obviously belongs to Dominion Energy, which we provided the EPC service for. And we've been awarded the Revolution uh, wind farm in partnership with Eversource. That's a 704 megawatt wind farm serving Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, South Fork, again with Eversource, uh, that's to New York, connecting into Long Island. The Sunrise Wind Project, again part of our Northeastern program with Eversource, um, that's 880 megawatts into New York. So together, you're looking somewhere in the region about 1.7 gigawatts going in to the Northeast uh, of, um, of the US. And then as we move further down the coast with uh, Ocean Wind, um, with the support of PSEG, that's a 1.1 gigawatt project into New Jersey and Skipjack Wind Farm into Maryland, which is 120 megawatts. And just now, the offshore wind developers are competing on approximately five gigawatts of solicitations before the end of this year, with New York that went in recently last month, New Jersey, that'll be going in again next month, 
Maryland as well has a window open as well. So the potential for offshore wind in the US is tremendous, really being driven by these state mandated targets. So John, if we can just jump to the next slide quickly. Block Island, uh, a pilot project, but a very important first for US offshore wind, 30 megawatts, powering 17,000 homes with an interconnector to the island of Block Island, first in the nation using six megawatt GE Halliad technology. So a very great collaboration there with one of the local local powerhouses in GE as well. Um, if we jump to the next slide, please. What does it mean, offshore wind? It means a lot of investment. You're looking at approximately $25 billion of investment and economic opportunity every year out to 2030 when these projects start to be kind of manufactured and, and, in, and installed uh, in the mid part of the decade. So it's a huge investment opportunity. We're already investing in Rhode Island, in Prodport Quonset. We're investing in Connecticut, in New London to upgrade the New London State Pier into a world-class um, turbine loadout harbor. We're investing in Baltimore, the former Bethlehem Steel facility um, to create secondary steel initiatives there to really support Maryland offshore wind. And we're investing in Long Island for operation and maintenance as well. So tremendous port and infrastructure opportunities there. And if we jump to the next slide, please, John. We were really excited about this partnership with Edison Trust, which we announced at the end of September. This is the first Jones Act compliant SOV for offshore winds will be manufactured in Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, not states that traditionally have been associated with offshore wind, but states with tremendous maritime heritage, tremendous marine economies. So we really feel that this is a great way in partnership with Edison Trust to bring the industry forward. And this SOV will serve us on a number of projects, including Revwind, uh, South Fork, and Sunrise Wind in the Northeast. So it's a very exciting moment for us in partnership with Edison Trust, and we're delighted with this and very much look forward to bringing this state-of-the-art SOV to market. So I'll pause there. That was really just the, the flavor I wanted to share with you. And back to you, Frederick. Yeah, thanks, Francis, and, and uh, uh, very informative. And um, on the note then, okay, I mean, I'm a vessel kind of guy. Uh, there's a continuing uh, build of experience and know-how, primarily from uh, Europe, but expanding both East and West. Uh, are there alternatives uh, of the tried and tested practices that you see not only innovative, but exciting and perhaps relevant for the U.S. in mind? Is there anything we could do differently or, or exciting opportunities in the U.S.? Well, I think we are building a new industry, but we're building on a very, very strong platform. You know, we have in the US the opportunity to build a supply chain that is truly world class, leveraging from some great experience. And I think, you know, that SOV example means we really are using the best in the industry to bring state of the art vessels forward. So I definitely point to that. I think, you know, clearly the prognosis is that the first projects will be built using a lot of global knowledge that we've assembled, but we quickly want to bring the local knowledge, the local workforce, the local supply chain up to speed. And the opportunity that we're looking at with such a large deployment of offshore wind um, from, you know, I'd say probably 23 onwards, as these large projects start to be built out multi gigawatt every year, means that that starts to become a real opportunity to leverage that US experience on top of the global expertise we have. Okay, no, no that, that, that makes sense. You, you have to, as I said, build with uh, a, a, a already uh, existing uh, supply chain to actually at least help you get going then, of course, the local supply chain will grow because it is a bit of a, uh, a, a new market uh, moving across the, the Atlantic. And, and as such, if you look at the broader picture of, of all the wind farms, not only your, your own, but, the, but your other peers and, and maybe competitors, depending on how you view this, many more companies are, are going to be building, uh, perhaps also at the same time. Uh, like I said earlier, we're counting uh, both turbines and installation vessels, and thinking there could be a uh, well, a, a supply squeeze in some ways of wind turbine installation vessels. And knowing the U.S. has the Jones Act and, and the well, not the challenges, I guess it's the opportunity for the U.S. industry to to capture a part of the market. Do you see there's a, a missing link that could perhaps be developed here? being this uh, feeder concept that we've seen uh, mentioned by some some companies. I mean, you you, you move over a, let's say, a foreign flag jack up, but you need a Jones Act flag 
and a US flag vessel to cater for the transportation of turbines and, 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 and different parts of the of the turbine. Uh, have you can you share any insights into installation philosophy as such? Is there anything you can share with us on that? Yeah, no, I think you're touching on a really interesting point there, Frederick. Um, the Jones Act is an opportunity to leverage the existing vessels here to refit, refurbish as necessary for off offshore wind and also to bring new vessels to market, as we talked about. So definitely a great opportunity for us to use that. Um, when we look at offshore wind installations, you know, the Seabow project was installed um, using a, a global installation vessel. And so that feeder concept you described was not present there. As you talked about in your um, presentation earlier, there are certain challenges, there are certain complexities around that particular process. That's not to say it can't be done, it absolutely can be done, but it does have certain challenges that need to be worked through. We're very fortunate to have excellent relationships with the major turbine suppliers um, to make sure that these processes can be optimized and those dialogues are ongoing and a very important part of how we plan to build these projects. I think an extra complexity we see is that we have very dynamic schedules driven by the current federal permitting constraints that we are facing. And that means that it's very difficult to plan to know exactly at what stage one will be committing to the vessels. Uh, vessel charters, as you mentioned in your presentation, uh, although proportionally a small piece of the overall capex picture is still a very material piece of the capex picture. And in a highly competitive market such as the US, we need to be ensuring that the vessels are optimized and used, and therefore we want the best solutions and we need to secure them at the right times. Um, so I think all options are on the table. And you know, if there is a if there is an attractive proposal that is a feeding solution, of course we will work with all parties to enable that. But at the same time, you mentioned that there's an ambition, an appetite, and even a space for world-class Jones Act installation vessels to come to market as well. And when one looks at the opportunity of 30 gigawatts plus here, there appears to be that space for those vessels to operate and be very successful. Absolutely, and I, and I, I, and I agree. I think we just need to see, I, th I think uh, financiers and ship owners uh, need to see some action, like I showed on the, on, on, on the that slide, you know, we see some steel in the water, because there's been so many false starts, if you know what I mean, like now it's happening next year or, or in two years. Of course, it was a, a bit of a, a, a sad well not sad star but a disappointment with vineyard wind not you know moving forward when they were planning to move forward because there was such a huge supply chain arranged around them and actually we you know i tell you we got some calls from some uh, us based ship owners asking us like guys will this industry ever happen you, you you keep talking about this exciting european industry maturing in the us and we're going to supply us flag vessel crew members etc but we keep being disappointed year after year after year. So yeah, I'm just uh, ranting on here. Uh, I think this will all uh, pan out and it will be a great industry for the, for the US uh, ship owners and shipyards and mariners and everybody. Uh, once they kind of see clarity here, and I, 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 did I read right that the BOEM is coming with their um, uh, final report around 15th of January? I, I guess that's gonna be an interesting date to, to follow for, for a couple of companies at least. I think we're all following that very closely. That's the um, the conclusion, obviously, of the uh, the vineyard federal permitting with the FEIS, yeah. and then ultimately, yeah. as you say, mid January. Um, that you know will really give clarity. It will give foresight to know what the program schedules are, and with that comes the confidence that you know these long lead item investments, including vessels, can can be made. So it's a tremendously important day for our industry, and we remain very optimistic. That you know, this industry, of course, I think new industries, particularly ones which are, you know, with such great capital investment as offshore wind requires, will always have these gestational challenges. But you know, we remain very optimistic that this industry, given the market support that we see from the sponsor states in the US, given the requirement for clean, high capacity factor energy in these states. Has, has a very, very strong future. It's just overcoming these kind of very near-term obstacles that we need to do in order to kind of get that clarity and that foresight to know how to really realize this industry. Exactly. So basically, an ocean of opportunities 
uh, just waiting for us. And I think unless you have some uh, some final uh, words here, I think we'll wrap it up there because I'm we're running out of uh, our time here together, uh, Francis. No, I think from our side, we're delighted to be part of this journey for US Offshore Wind. We're very supportive of bringing Jones Act compliant, optimized solutions to market. We've, um, you know, we've worked, obviously, as I mentioned, with Edison Schwest. We've worked with WindServe on the CTVs. We really see the opportunities in this market, and we look forward to collaborating with, with many of you. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Frederick, for an excellent presentation, and look forward to connecting with many of you in the future. Thank you very much.